Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Joe again on this Wednesday evening. I hope everybody's doing well. I hope everyone's having a good time. Uh, weather's very warm over here in the D.C. area. Very strange for February. The weather's very nice, uh, which is fine with me. You know, I like warm weather. Give me warm weather any day than uh, miserable uh, freezing cold weather. Anyway, so today we've got another action-packed session, informative information-packed session. And we're going to talk about how to avoid <clears throat> over improving your properties, uh, you know, and uh, hopefully making bigger profits. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, that's the title here, how to avoid over improving properties and potentially making bigger profits. And, uh, you know, kind of talk about that for various reasons. Uh, I'll get into that in a few seconds. I think it's a very timely pro uh, topic, uh, the market's slowing which means that there's going to be greater opportunities. And if you can buy, now's the time to get in. But you have to be careful when you buy. And you have to be careful if you're going to make some, um, you know, improvements to the property. So that way you can uh, stay in control of the budget and uh, don't get too carried away with, uh, you know, um, let's just say uh, avoidable mistakes. How about that? So, okay, as usual... We have, uh, towards the end, we're going to have a QA and a session. So get your questions together, and uh, we'll have it uh, in the chat box. So put in the chat box your questions, and I'll get to them later on today. Uh, well, today, later on, this, uh, what's it called, a live stream. And uh, as usual, please don't wait until the end. Put your comments in early, and that way we can try to get as many questions as answered as possible. Uh, just a little shout-out to Russell Brazil. And the folks down at DC Rockstar Rear Meter, uh, we had a, a great fun time last uh, last Thursday. I was the guest uh, speaker at the uh, at the uh, you know the, the Rear meeting. It was packed. Uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but our envision is probably you know greater than 100. Or anyway, from 80 to 100 people were there. Uh, great turnout. Uh, great energy. Uh, I don't know if you were there. If you were there, please feel free to. Uh, let me know your thoughts. And uh, so I shared what I do. Uh, I talked about more about buying whole strategy and uh, and then delve a bit more deeper into the whole section eight uh, niche uh, within the buying hold, the burr, and uh, had a lot of good questions at the end. And uh, I shared with people, attendees, that I will be doing this uh, new, new program shortly. And uh, it, we're going to call it the JV Wealth Builders Program. JV Wealth Builders Program. And uh, so I shared that to the audience and uh, what it's all about. It's really a done-for-you model where I help you and work on one-on-one -on -one to execute, to get a deal done so you can leverage my systems, my relationships, my 20, you know, 35 plus years uh, in terms of finding deals, getting the money, uh, getting the rehab, and also uh, finding the tenant. So all that's part of the program. And uh, for those people who waved their hand, quite a lot of people did. I was surprised. I was shocked, in fact. And we uh, I followed up with everybody uh, with a questionnaire. And hopefully we'll do some one-on-one -on -one discussions. And then we'll start the program soon. Anyway, so that's what happened. Uh, if you're interested, just let me know. Um, but I think we probably got all the number of people that we need at this point. Um, yeah, so that was last Wednesday. Again, shout out to uh, Russ. And the folks down at DC Rockstar uh, Rear meeting. Okay, so I think, oh yeah, I will be going to Ghana. Uh, officially got my tickets uh, today. So we'll be going, uh, when are we leaving? We're leaving February the 22nd. Uh, for just over two weeks, we'll be going until March the 9th. Uh, returning March the 9th to the US. So we'll be going in Ghana for a couple of weeks. Uh, I'll be spending some time with my parents, my mother. Uh, my family, my sisters, and my brother, uh, they are currently there. And we'll be some, do some travel. Uh, we're going to Accra, which is the capital. And then we're probably going to go to a place called Kumasi, which is the second city in Ghana. Uh, in fact, that was where I was born. And so we're going to go over there and spend some time down there. And then probably do some travel uh, within Ghana itself. So I'm looking forward to that one. Looking forward to the nice weather, the great people. And uh, eating some local food, pound some fufu, and all that stuff. Anyway, enough of that. So that's my schedule. I'll be doing some traveling. First time I'm traveling overseas this year. My goal is to do at least three trips this year. 
hopefully we're going to Mexico uh, sometime in the summer. And we're going to go to possibly uh, Uganda or Kenya, uh, and Kenya, I suppose, uh, later on towards the end of the year. So that's my plans. We may sneak in another overseas trip uh, within that time. So we'll see. Anyway, so let's get down to it. Uh, how to avoid over-improving properties and potentially making bigger profits. So again, if you've got questions, put them in the chat box and I'll try and get to them later on today. Okay, so uh, one of the things which uh, a lot of beginners, um, you know, uh, a trap that a lot of new beginners uh, investors get into is uh, over-improving their property. You know, um, I mean, I've made that mistake. Uh, some people say I still make that mistake. Uh, but there's a reason why I tend to do what I do in terms of the properties. We'll get to that a bit later on. But uh, one, especially this is especially true if you're going to be flipping properties. Uh, and I've made that mistake. Oh, my goodness. Because at some point, you know, you buy a house and uh, you improve it. And so you increase the value. But at some point, there's a fine line whereby if you spend more money on the house, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get more uh, a sell a higher sales price, or it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get more rent. Okay, so it gets to what we call diminishing the laws of diminishing returns, and uh, where you can you know you kind of uh, start uh, plateauing in terms of the uh, the cost benefit, how much you spend, and the benefit that you get out of that expenditure. So the issue then becomes when is enough enough? in terms of your rehab because once you reach that point you can spend more money does it but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get anything returned back okay you reach that point of no return or the law of diminishing returns okay so it becomes less profitable uh because all you're doing is spending more money uh but your returns are you know are not com uh, comm commensurate same thing with renting uh, you know, what I do is the Section 8 model, and the Section 8 model is all about bedrooms and location, neighborhoods or the zip code. So if you have uh, a four-bedroom house, for example, in a given zip code, the many times the housing authority caps how much you can get based on the location and number of bedrooms. So if you keep on spending more money, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get more money because the max that you're going to get is capped. Okay, So then you have to decide when is enough enough because you're not going to get any more rent. Same thing if you're going to market renters. Just because you've got gold-plated faucets or whatever, it doesn't necessarily mean you can get more rent. Uh, you're limited by the location and the features of the property. So that's really what it's going to be. So what we're going to do is talk about the how to avoid over-improvement, especially if you're implementing the Burr strategy. That's what we're going to do. And um, so I'll kind of describe through the process flow for the Burr and uh, especially the rehab portion. And but experience has told me, experience now over my, my many years, is that if you focus on the big problems uh, associated with the borough, associated with the rehab, then the small problems will kind of take care of itself and, uh, and so on. So let's get going. The question is, what does it mean to over improve on your property? What does that really mean? Okay, to over improve. Uh, so we're going to take the scenario of a flipping, okay? When you're house flipping, uh, as I said earlier on, you buy a house that needs work, and the goal is that you're going to add some value. You're going to do something to the property to add value, to improve it. And by adding value, you're going to increase the potential price, the after-repair value of that asset, okay? Because you're improving the property. So, um, you know, so obviously you're going to spend money on the improvement. And uh, at some point, though, you keep on improving, 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 and you can't recoup, uh, you know, the, 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 from the sales price. Uh, so, you know, you kind of now reach that point whereby it doesn't really make any sense to keep on continuing spending more money because all it's doing is taking away from your bottom line. Okay. So, for many investors, you have to, it's really important, it's imperative really to avoid this at all costs because all it's going to do is eat into your profit. And, and one of the things, and I, I'll share some story, is that especially, you know, people say, ah, well, you know, want to be nice if we did this. 
Well, won't it be nice if we did that? Well, won't it be nice if we did that, 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 whatever that is, okay? Yes, it would be nice, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get more money. And I'll give you an example. Uh, I bought a house up in D.C. many years ago. This is a flip. And uh, so we, uh, we bought the house. We rehabbed it. And we put it on the market. And uh, I thought, well, wouldn't it be nice if we put some higher-end carpet in the basement? And uh, so I don't know what possessed me to do that, but I, you know, rather than the standard builder's grade carpet, we decided to go, go with kind of a, a higher end carpet with nice plush padding and nice, you know, whatever carpets do these days. Uh, so we did that anyway and spent more money on that. And uh, but the house also, uh, one thing, one of my signatures is I always try to include a pantry in the kitchen. So amongst all the, the rehabs, we put a pantry in the kitchen. Anyway, uh, so we got a contract on the house. I was all excited, you know, counting my money. And, uh, and so uh, we went to sale. Everything went smoothly. And uh, I don't know what it was, but maybe a few days later, uh, I think my contractor had to go there for some reason. Uh, anyway, so he went back to the house and they had ripped out the carpet. All that high-end carpet that we put in there, uh, they ripped it out because to them it was of no value. And so all this money that we spent was a total waste of time. And uh, at the settlement table, uh, my agent asked them, well, what made you want to buy this house? And apparently it was the pantry. Uh, that was of more importance to them, more value to them, having a pantry in a kitchen than it was, than it was having this high-end carpet. So I overspent. Obviously, there's no way of me knowing. Uh, but there's certain things that it just doesn't make any sense to go overboard on. And there's certain things that it does make sense to go overboard on because you're going to be able to attract the attention of the buyer. And also, you may, you may, uh, you know, kind of in a slow market, so it's not always the case, but you may get a higher price as well. So, you know, so it's really important if you are flipping to be aware of some of these things because your rehab cost is going to make a big impact uh, as to whether you become profitable, whether you break even, or whether you lose money, okay? So your purchase price is one thing. Um, you know, that has a bearing. The financing cost has a bearing. The rehab cost also has a bearing. And your uh, selling costs has a bearing. So if you can reduce your expenses in any of those areas, you're more likely to make a profit. But if you can contain and control your rehab budget, then you should be pretty good. So that, how do we go about doing this? I like to start by thinking backwards when doing a burr. Okay. You know, the, the burr is buy, renovate, rent, refinance, and then repeat. Okay. Buy, renovate, Buy, renovate, rent, refinance, repeat. Okay, that's what it is, the burr. And uh, normally it goes in that sequence. You buy first, you then renovate, you then uh, rent, and then obviously you hopefully recoup your money and refinance, and then you repeat the whole thing again. So that's the process. But my thinking is that if a deal comes to you, uh, then I like to work backwards from the back end. So I start off with the refi. Okay, which is the last I. Well, not the last I. The last I is repeat, but the refi. So I start with the refi, and uh, you know it's kind of reverse engineering, and uh, you know, and I think that that's where we need to do. Okay, because if you, uh, you know, start from the refi perspective, then it can help you in uh, avoiding over improving on the property. It can help you reduce your risks uh, and it gives you a better grip on the deal itself. It forces you to analyze the deal in more detail, which hopefully will boost your confidence and uh, as you go through it. So how do we, what do I mean by start with a refi? So you plan the exit, the refi portion, as your first step. Okay, so you start with the end in mind, as they say. And, um, you know, hey, that is... A lesson that I've learned. You start with the 
uh, the end in mind. And that is you're going to do a refi at some point to hopefully recoup all your money or well, most of your money. And the assumption is that you're going to be able to refinance it at a certain price. Okay, that's this. Once the rehab is done, once the tenant is in place, you got income to the property, then typically that's what I do is then I make a, a loan application in order to refinance the property and replace the short-term uh, financing with permanent financing. So you kind of line everything up when you start thinking backwards. So what you want to do with that? Start with you talk to some lenders, okay? Because the lenders are the ones who's going to help you refi. You're going to go to a bank. You're going to go to a financial institution uh, in order to do the re refinance. So you need to talk before you get too carried away. You want to be. You want to have had some conversations with some lenders, and they will tell you what type of products are available, uh, what the cost of those funds are, and what are the hoops that you're going to have to go through in order to get the money and uh, you know, and how much you can actually pull out as part of the refinance. So they'll tell you all of those things. Uh, so it's better to know now before you actually buy the house or do the rehab uh, exactly, can you get the refinance? Can you get the money? What are the pros and cons? What are the steps that you have to go through in order to get the money? How much is the loan to value to this lender uh, borrow to? What do you need to do in terms of debt to income ratio? What do you need to do in terms of the what we call DSCR, debt service coverage ratio? All these things uh, you're going to need to find out from the lender. Okay. And I suggest that you find that out before, not afterwards. What well, not after you've done the refi, you've done the uh, you got the tenant in there, and then you find out, well, you know, we can only lend you 70%. And you've done your calculations based on 80% loan to value. Now it's too late. Now you have to start looking around for somebody else uh, and, you know, to allow you to recoup more of your money. Okay. So that's the thing. So what's the, what one of the key things though is the ARV. So you have to know the ARV, the after repair value of this asset that you're buying. And uh, this is really, really important because the after repair value is going to have a big factor in how much money you can pull out, how much you can refinance. Because if you, if, let's just say the after repair value is 100000 and this lender will give you a 70% loan to value, then it means that you can pull out $70,000 as part of the refi. If this lender will go to 75%, then you can borrow 75,000 and 80%, 80%, 80,000, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So you need to get some idea of the after repair value. So how are you going to find that? Uh, one of the ways is ask, uh, you know, professionals, whether it be, uh, your realtor, the realtor should be able to do some comparisons, uh, and give you what we call CMA comparative market analysis. And they should be able to tell you you know, uh, approximately how much this house would, uh, what the comps are for similar types of houses in your area. And uh, some, you know, especially now, I would suggest that you be conservative on those after repair value because the market is kind of soft right now. So you don't want to get too optimistic, too aggressive on what you think you can get uh, and the market turns on you. Okay, so when, when you do your uh, your comps, Try to be uh, a little bit conservative. And uh, if you want to do better, you may want to ask a couple of realtors or several realtors. And uh, and therefore, you get their opinions uh, from different people. So, you know, I wouldn't suggest that you just rely on one person only, uh, just in case. I would say at least two people. And people that you know, people that you trust, uh, who don't have hidden agendas to give you numbers that makes it work for them, but not necessarily work for you, okay? And uh, and so on. So once you have the ARV, the after repair value, then you can start talking about your rehab costs. OK, so then you're going to have to determine, OK, then, well, what are the rehab costs? How am I going to find that out? What do I need to do? And that's where you want to contact your contractors. Uh, because the contractors will pretty much know once you have an idea of the scope of work, um, you know, uh, the scope of work is what needs to be done, then how much is it going to cost? Uh, you know, either in labor uh, or labor materials or, or whatever. And then you want to have a little fudge factor, 10% or more, uh, just in case for overages and uh, unknowns and things like that. Okay. So you want to spend some time with your contractor uh, to gauge 
how much it's going to cost to renovate this property. Now, if you're doing Section 8, uh, you know, since the rent is, you know, uh, connected to the number of bedrooms, you have to decide how many bedrooms are we going to have in this house and, uh, and what's the cost of associated with adding the bedroom and what's the benefit in terms of extra rent that you can get. So what I typically do, I like to have houses with basements and uh, whereby I can add bedrooms. And then it becomes a matter of how many bedrooms can I get? Uh, in some cases, I can get one extra bedroom. In other cases, I can get two. Uh, one of the houses I've done before, we're able to get three bedrooms in the basement. So we turned a three bedroom into a six bedroom house. So once we know what the, um, you know, the after repair value is, we have an idea of what the cost is going to be uh, for these different scenarios. I think that the greatest way, the greatest ROI return on investment is by adding bedrooms if you're going to be uh, doing Section 8 because there's a direct correlation between bedrooms and rent. So, uh, you know, so therefore you have to decide what the scope of work is going to be and then you're going to have to reach out to some contractors uh, who can then give you some idea of, uh, you know, what to, uh, you know, what to do in order to um, get the rents that you need. OK, so know your ARV by reaching out to real estate agents. Also know your ARV based on the amount of work that needs to be done and which your contractor can find that out for you. Next thing is you have to improve or get to an idea of what the market rents are. This is really quite easy. Uh, there are lots of different programs, software out here, uh, websites that you can go to where you can plug in uh, an address and uh, and then you can get an idea what rents are going for. There's uh, I know one I use is called Rentometer. Uh, Rentometer, that's a pr pretty popular one. Zillow has a tool uh, where you can plug in an address. It'll give you an idea what rents are going for. Uh, you may speak to other people like at the RIA meetings and other real estate investing uh, folks, they can give you an idea. You can speak to property managers. Uh, property managers, obviously they're in the business. Uh, they're in the, you know, they may be very knowledgeable of the market conditions and market rents in your area. So you can reach out to them. Uh, so lots of different places you can go to in order to get an idea of what the market rents are, are, are going for. So again, Zillow, Craigslist, um you know property managers and so forth so what you want to do is before you purchase you should know what the houses in the areas are going for okay just like the arv you want to check uh, the rent comparisons and then you want to uh, get an idea of you know you kind of want to make your house somewhat similar to what's out there in the neighboring area so you don't want to over improve but then again you don't want to under improve so what you want to do you want to take some photographs uh, rentals, um, you know, in your area and, uh, make a note of how much they rent for. And, um, uh, you know, based on that, you can then start developing your scope of work in terms of what you need to do in order to get the rent that you're looking for, or to get the sale price that you're looking for. Uh, when you're looking at other, other properties, you know, look at certain things like, you know, what kind of flooring do they have? What kind of kitchen cabinets do they have? Um, you know, uh, is it open space or is it closed in? Uh, what about the front yard, the backyard? Uh, so there's lots of different things, you know, you can look at, uh, you know, in order to kind of gauge what the market, uh, you know, what the market conditions are uh, for your project once it becomes available for sale, okay? So you kind of want to do some comparisons. What I do, because I, when I do my rentals, I'm trying to be, I try to just have a, a better product. So I don't have a problem spending a bit more money, even though I know I'm not gonna um, you know, recoup it because I'm going to attract a much better quality tenant. And my tenants are looking to stay for five, 10, 15, 20 years. So I'll make it, I'll recoup that money over time, either in terms of less turnover or either in terms of, well, I, you know, I've it's it's the, the the best time to do the rehab is now uh because uh, your contract is already in the property so i'd rather just be done with it knock out as much as you know um what needs to be done now whilst the contract is there while the doors are open and uh, you know and so on so the cheapest time to do any renovations is now when you are doing the main renovations 
as opposed to waiting towards the end and uh, and so on. OK, so you need to be aware of what your competition uh, is doing in terms of their, um, you know, their like or their, their, their properties. And you want to be able to share that with the contractors uh, because uh, by knowing what the market's offering, you have a pretty good idea what your competition is up to and what the market will bear. OK, so if you're interested in the Section 8 program, as I said before, uh, the rent that you get is based on two criteria or two factors. One is the zip code or the neighborhood where the property is. And the other one is the number of bedrooms. So knowing the above, you can decide where to buy, what improvements you should make. And uh, I typically go from three bedrooms, one bath to five bedrooms, three and a half bath. That's what I do. So for flips, focus on those activities that add value. Okay. That's where you want to go because there's direct correlation between uh, when you what you spend uh, your money on and the return and the selling price that you're going to get. So once you've um, you know you, once you've got a kind of a, a renovation budget, uh, stick to your spending money. Don't try not to over improve. Try not to get too carried away with what we call um, scope creep. And um, you know because you could spend more money, but not necessarily increase the price or the rents that you're going to get okay so in general it's hard to go wrong uh on certain things like kitchens um or uh replacing old side side ins uh basement improvements that usually brings a lot of value so you kind of focus on those things where you know uh sellers are or buyers are very much interested in okay so but again keep in mind that doing a renovation doesn't necessarily mean that remodeling from the ground up or doing a, what we call a, what do you call that thing? Uh, gut level rehab. Okay. You don't have to take everything down to the stubs, studs. Uh, so it could be simply just things like replacing the worn out kitchen uh, with new granite countertops and uh, new cabinets, maybe replacing old vinyl sidings with new sidings or replacing old flooring with new flooring. So there's lots of different things you can do. And uh, as part of the renovation process, but again, you need to develop your budget and also you need to make sure that your scope is defined well. Again, we're going to go down to Q&A very shortly. So again, if you've got questions, please put them in the chat box and uh, I will answer them very, very shortly. So bear with me. We're getting now towards the end. And uh, but put your questions in the chat box and I'll try and get to you shortly. So. Um, so finding the, uh, for, so for flips, again, focus on those things that add value. And, uh, because if you do that, you should be okay. Okay. Next go down to make design choices that will appeal to the masses. Uh, you only got so much money you have, and you've got to spend your contractor dollars on those items. That's going to give you the biggest bang for the buck. My thing is I always focus on those things that appeal to the, the lady of the house uh, because, uh, you know, usually uh, the, the, the lady of the house is usually the one that makes the decision uh, as to whether we're going to go with this house or not. That's just been my experience. And so it's important that you do things that uh, appeals to the lady of the house. And I mean, the guys of the house, I mean, they usually just go along for the ride and, and, and so on. But it's the woman of the house is usually the one that is the one that if she says no, then there's no way you're going to that house. And uh, my experience for what it is, is that if a guy likes a house and a woman doesn't like the house, they're not going in. Uh, if the woman likes it and the guy doesn't like it, eh, there's a pretty good chance they're going to go there anyway. And uh, same thing for rentals as well. That's been my experience. Uh, you know, if you don't believe me, maybe you put that in the, in the chat box and uh, we can debate that. So uh, so what's it called? Make make design design decisions that appeal to the masses. I would say more specifically to the ladies of the house in your area, um, you know, in terms of your taste, in terms of the final fixtures, what people see and, um, and so on. So you want to kind of focus on the a larger pool of buyers or a larger pool of, of renters, as opposed to niche buyers, things that appeal to certain people, but not most people. Okay. So uh, then the next thing you want to focus on is finding the market rent. We kind of alluded to that earlier on. Uh, real estate agents, the housing authorities, wherever your property is located. You can do some research on the internet um, and uh, you can maybe ask investor, uh, fellow investors, real estate investors at RIAs. 
you can go to uh, property managers. They have a pretty good idea what rents are going for in a particular area. And uh, you can do your own research. Uh, I, you know, because I do a lot of rentals for Section 8, I just find out what the market, the housing authority uh, will pay. And I base my rent on that. And uh, that's me. I'm not saying that you should do that, but I think that's just one element of the equation. So before you bid on the house, uh, you know, you kind of have to work backwards uh, in terms of what the re uh, refi, uh, you know, what's it going to take to get the refi? Uh, what's the uh, the hoops you have to go through to get the money? Uh, what are the criteria that the banks and the lenders are looking for? And uh, you want to know what the ARV is going to be. You also want to know what the market rents is going to be and uh, and so on. So, you know, so at this point, you've talked to the lenders to make sure you have a clear strategy on the refinance. You've talked to your agent and found solid after repair values. Uh, you've spoken to property managers uh, to find out what rents are going for in that particular area. And uh, you've talked to contractors to know what type of, what's it gonna cost to do certain types of uh, improvements, okay? So you have all the information before you, uh, before you've actually made a purchase on the property. Uh, so that's the good thing. You think with the end in mind, you haven't made an offer, but you now have all the information that you need to throw into the, you know, into a spreadsheet calculator, whatever it is, in order to, in order to determine how much you should offer this uh, for this property. You know, and uh, and that's it. So what you're doing again is uh, you want to avoid is you're buying a house, not a home. Many, most of the times you're not going to live there. Uh, this is just for investment purposes, and uh, and don't get too carried away over improvement. Because if you see it as a home, you can start doing some little bit of this, a little bit of that, and you know, and next thing you know, it looks beautiful. You wouldn't have a problem living there, but you spent so much money that you're not going to recoup your costs. Okay, so treat it like a house and not necessarily a home. Now, with that said, I treat my places as a home. <laughs> so do as I say, not as I do, huh? Uh, so I, you know, I'm trying to appeal to the creme de la creme. I stage my home, my houses, to make it appear like a home. And it's very warm, very emotional connections. And so when people come in to my homes, my goal is to... Um, make them fall in love with the house. Okay, so that's why I kind of go a little bit extra. So I buy granite instead of formica. Uh, I put nice ceiling fans instead of no ceiling fans. Um, you know, I have accent walls, so it's not just all white. Uh, we have, you know, accent walls with different colors. So these are some of the things that I do as part of my uh, renovations to, again, differentiate myself from my competition, other uh, landlords who are looking to appeal to these tenants. But uh, the the the, com uh, but the context is still the same. Don't get too carried away. Don't get too uh, attached to the home, because emotions will uh, result in you making some terrible uh, decisions. And so, for new landlords, uh, many times you get the urge to over improve, try to uh, you know stay away from that if possible. And I know I get it. You want to be something that you're proud of and something that you're happy with. Uh, but after all is said and done, it is a business. You're not going to live there for the most part. And all you need to do is to make sure you can appeal to the kind of tenant that you're trying to attract. Uh, but, you know, it is your asset. It's probably your biggest asset that you have, but it's doable to keep it under control. So what's the bottom line after all is said and done? At the end of the day, uh, you know, stopping yourself from over-improving is going to be uh, it's going to be in your best interest. It's all about having a clear idea of what renovation budget uh, you have and sticking to it. Don't get too carried away with scope creep. Don't get too carried away about you know being the best house in the block or best house in the neighborhood. It's not really necessary. It's nice, but it's not necessary. You will still rent the property, but you may not get any more rent. So if you use comparables, uh, you know comps to get a reasonable asking price before you get started uh, and all those things that we talked about in terms of finding out about the financing, in terms of the ARV, in terms of the rehab costs and so on, you can make some uh, pretty good decisions. And if necessary, uh, if it doesn't work out, then you just walk away and just keep on going. The market's slow right now. So this, you know, this is a good time to, to, uh, to get in, good time to buy. And uh, it's a good time to make some offers. So that my friends is it 
for today in terms of the uh, Q&A. So I'm going to go to, uh, uh, what's it called, the chat box shortly. So if you've got some questions, please put them in the chat box and uh, I will try to answer them for you. Let me just quickly go through what we've discussed today. Uh, we talked about, you know, um, uh, let's have a look. What was the first thing? How to avoid over improving your properties. Uh, we talked about that, or things that you need to look for. We talked about thinking backwards uh, when uh, doing this, i.e., start off with the end in mind, uh, do the uh, refinance, the financing, um, you know, start off with the financing, get an idea of what you can do in terms of financing, in terms of your lender, what hoops you have to go through, what's the interest rate, what's the terms, all those things you need to know. Uh, so that means that you talk to some lenders and uh, find out you know what differentiates lender a from lender b lender c and so forth next thing you want to do is know your after repair value that's really important because that will determine how much you can potentially pull out and uh as part of the refinance process and uh, you also need to know what's the uh you know what do you need to do to improve the rents and also you need to um you know sort of uh be aware of scope and making sure that you understand what activities give you the biggest bang for the re, uh, biggest bang for the buck as they say and so make design decisions accordingly that meets uh, that attracts and appeals to the masses and uh, then you want to obviously find the market rent uh, the best way to do that you can do some research on things like rentometer uh, zillow craigslist um, you know maybe speak to a, a real estate agent they can give you some idea what the rents are going to be uh you're buying a house not a home you're not living there it should be nice but it doesn't have to be the best house in the whole neighborhood and uh and the bottom line really is that you can do this uh if you can avoid making over improving properties then you're more likely to cash flow and also you're more likely to make a profit if you decide you want to flip the profit uh flip the home so my friends that is it for today so we're now going to go to q a so get your questions together and I will get to them. Again, if you want to reach out to me, you can email me at joe at joeasimo.com, joe at joeasimo.com. And I will try. I don't really check my emails that often, but I will try to be more responsive. I apologize to those people who sent me emails. Uh, I will try to be more responsive. And as I said before, we, uh, we're we going to start this new program called the JV Wealth Builders Program very shortly. And uh, I'm really excited by that one. It gives the chance to... I can work with you one on one uh, in terms of finding deals, uh, in terms of finding, getting the financing, doing the renovations, and also doing the renting. That's what I'm going to be doing for you one on one. Uh, so it's going to be a, the greatest program. It's really a done for you type model, and I'm really excited to try it out and uh, and so on. So that, my friends, is it for today. So let's go to uh, Q and A, uh, and let's see what's out there. Okay. So again, we have. Uh, I hope I spelled it. Uh, Rocio, Rocio, uh, Galdemez, Rocio, Rocio. I, I apologize if I uh, uh, didn't pronounce that correctly. I hope all is well. I'm not too sure what you mean by hand pink waving. So I assume that you are waving to me. Well, I am waving back to you. Hope all is well with you. And uh, let's have a look. Justin Blair, do you use the same design scheme for all your investment properties? Uh, not necessarily. It depends. But most of the times we do. Uh, I like to have a bathroom on every level. So usually on a, uh, a typical DC row house, there's a powder room on the first floor, living room, dining room, kitchen, upstairs. Typically there's three bedrooms. I like to have uh, two bathrooms upstairs if possible. Uh, so that way we have a master uh, for the main bedroom. And then we also have a common bathroom. And then typically in the basement, there's either one or two bedrooms down there, and another bathroom down there. Uh, so that's a typical flow. Uh, for my property in terms of the design scheme. Uh, but, you know, you can go to uh, an architect and architect, uh, they use a pretty creative. Uh, but I reached the point whereby I can go to a house and pretty good, get a good idea of what it is that uh, I need to do. Uh, it's based a lot on the square footage of the house. Obviously, the bigger the house, the more flexibility you have. And the smaller the house, uh, the less flexibility you have. So um, I have a similar design scheme. Uh, in terms of principles, but obviously the specifics of a particular deal, it'll just vary from deal to deal. So hopefully that answers your question, Justin. Again, if you've got some questions, 
it's, it's Spivy. Hey, Spivy, how are you? And uh, hope all is well in your world. And uh, hope that today is uh, is a good day for you. Do you recommend, again, if you've got some questions, please put them in. Otherwise, I'm going to wrap it up early, a little early today. Uh, my wife has been watching this new Amsterdam, uh, what do you call it, uh, thing on Netflix. I don't really get into, I don't watch that much TV, tell the truth. Uh, because it, you know, especially these series, it can suck you in. Once you get in it, you know, you can't get out. You just end up watching binge, binge watching, and you end, end up spending five, ten hours in front of a TV, which makes no sense to me. Anyway, do you recommend any good books for starting out? Uh, yes, there's some. The book I always like, I really enjoy that one, is the Millionaire Real Estate Investor. I don't know for some reason it's 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 a really good book. Um, also. The author is uh, Gary Keller and Jay Papizan. Uh, that's a good book. Uh, I think Think and Grow Rich is a good book. Um, and uh, but I listen to a lot of podcasts. Uh, I find a lot of good information on podcasts, and especially good podcasts where you know they they talk about uh, you know the host is experienced, not just talking fluffy stuff. Uh, I like to. You know, I, I find it enjoyable when I'm hearing somebody who's actually teaching something and not just peddling, uh, you know, some program or some mastermind or whatever it is, um, you know, and so on. So I, I enjoy uh, masterminds. Oh, not masterminds, sorry. Uh, um, podcasts, um, obviously audio books, and then you have the books itself. Uh, I usually like audio books because I can listen to it while I'm on the move. And, uh, and not necessarily have to be, you know, sitting down with a book in my hand. Okay, let's have a look. Anyway, so hope all is well with you, uh, uh, Spivy. Spivey. Uh, next question. Again, if you've got some questions, please put them in. I will try to get to you as soon as possible. Uh, wealth and wellness is grace. Great points. I haven't had an opportunity to burr. Looking forward to doing one before the end of the year. Well, I'm, I hope you... Uh, you reach that goal, uh, wealth and wellness with grace. And uh, yeah, it's not going to be easy, but it's doable. And sometimes you just have to take action. You're going to make some mistakes. Yes, it's scary. It's very intimidating. But if you got certain things lined up and if you surround yourself with experienced people, especially a mentor or a coach who's, who's, you know, has got a lot of proven track record of success. That way, you know, if you make them part of your team, then they can help you make what I call unnecessary mistakes. Okay. You know, that's, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said for experience uh, because experience, you know, uh, you know, hopefully, and there's, there's nothing wrong with having bad experiences as well. Uh, Cause I've learned a lot from my bad mistakes and I think I'm a better person. And my mistakes is, is what has led me to this strategy that I do. Uh, the burr strategy with a section eight twist. It's going through cycles. It's going through tenants who don't want to pay you. Uh, I wanted that guaranteed income stream. And I wanted my tenants to be there for a long time, five, 10, 15, 20 years. That's what I wanted. And uh, putting all that together, that's what kind of helped me develop the, the strategy and the program that I have. Okay, let's have a look. Next question. Again, if you've got some questions, please put them in. I'll try to answer them. Um, uh, hi, Dr. Joe. This is Johnny. Hey, Johnny. Hope you're, hope you're doing well. It's, it's great seeing you last Wednesday. Hope you had a good time. Hi, Dr. Joe. Have you seen any good financing out there in this market for a newbie purchasing their first rehab to include the cost uh, of uh, for a buy and hold? Yeah, there's quite a few um, uh, financing uh, options out there. Um, you know, obviously, you have the local commercial banks. Uh, they know, uh, what's it called? They know the area and, uh, usually decisions are made locally so you can get to know them. You can develop relationships with them. If you've got a credibility kit, you can show them what you are, uh, what you do and things like that. Uh, I'm not a great fan of those big box, uh, big banks like Wells Fargo and, um, you know, Bank of America and Chase and those guys, nothing against them. It's just that, uh, I like to develop relationships and the best relationships are usually, with uh, the local banks where decisions are made locally and you can sort of get to know people 
and uh, you can really build the trust and you can build the reputation and uh, and so on. So that's uh, me there. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, for in terms of uh, the financing on the acquisition side, yeah, there's several sources. Uh, I've got a couple that I use. So if you want to reach out to me, Johnny, I'll be more than happy to share some of that with you. Uh, there are hard money lenders. Um, there are local banks. And some of these banks are getting quite aggressive uh, in terms of what they'll do. And uh, in fact, I have a, a meeting tomorrow with a potential banker. And so hopefully I'll learn more about what they have to offer. And, um, and who knows, I could maybe uh, bring some leads uh, to everybody if, if you need it for financing. Uh, okay, Kayla Williams, if we don't have a good credit and want to join the program, should we? uh yes and no it depends it depends on when you say you don't have good credit that not necessarily necessary but you do need to be able to get financing um and credit you know is important for financing it's not the be all and end all but it's important your history of paying bills uh meeting your financial responsibilities that's important for some people some lenders so you don't have to have perfect credit but you do need to be bankable and that's some of the things that we'll talk about uh, during the program. How do you position yourself so that you can get financing? How do you uh, get your documents together such that it appeals to the decision, the decision maker uh, and so on? So these are all the things that you need to do if you want to join the program. Uh, but depending on your scenario, you may be able to get financing uh, with, uh, instead of a bank, it could be a hard money lender. Yeah, you know, and so on. So, uh, but yeah, so it's not absolutely critical, but I do want to be honest. If you've got a credit score of like 300 or 400, it's going to be hard, very, very hard to get financing because you haven't shown um, a track record of being responsible on your financial obligations. Okay, let's go to uh, Lewis M. Uh, how burdensome is obtaining permits for home improvements in DC? It's not really that burdensome. It depends on the scope of the project um you know it it just depends uh if if in doubt you may want to get a, a a contractor or an architect probably an architect who uh can put together some scenarios in terms of design options and then you pick the one that makes the most sense for you and that's what i do i always have architects on my projects and uh for my projects the architect um, will put the permit in my name Okay, and uh, and therefore the permit follows me. So uh, that's what we do on mine. The architect pulls the permit, the building permit, and then the contractors will pull their own respective permits, whether it be electrical, plumbing, uh, HVAC, and so forth. Okay, so it's not too bad to to to, to get permits in DC. I know there's a a bad sort of a bad rap about it, but uh, once you get to know the players down there. Uh, and you know what they're looking for, usually you can sort of navigate that uh, process without too much drama. Okay, Spivy again. Hi, Spivy. What makes you get into Section 8, if you don't mind me asking? I like Section 8 for several reasons. One is uh, the guaranteed rent, uh, especially during a downturn when market renters lose their jobs. If they lose their job, then you may not get paid. So I like that reliable income stream, the guaranteed rent. It doesn't matter. The money still hit my account as long as the tenant is there. Two, uh, I like about Section 8. I just like the, the fact that I'm making an opportunity or providing an opportunity for some of these families uh, who, under normal circumstances, wouldn't be attractive to some landlords. Um, you know, it, it's, it's very nice, uh, you know, when you can give opportunities to families uh you know and you have that option uh I, I i like that uh it's 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 good and it allows me anyway to build wealth which is important but also allows me to what we call uh you know uh build wealth and uh and do good um just uh i mean we've got so many stories in fact i was with one of my students this week uh he went to uh do a home visit uh, a prospective tenant's uh home uh went well and he offered the property to his family so uh that's what i enjoy about it and uh and that's what got me into this whole 
the whole thing is that yes we can make money which is important but also you can do good as well okay let's have a look next question kayla again hi kayla thank you i have a 620 credit score credit score so i'm going to fix that then join yeah i mean you got a good point uh, i think uh, the key is going to be um you know your ability to get financing uh, if you can get financing right now then hey you can join because the whole purpose of the program is to execute, is to do deals, is not to talk around and just look at the weather. Uh, it's to actually go out there and buy deals. And uh, and therefore, you'll be able to access and leverage my network, my relationships, my systems, my tools, et cetera, and so forth. So again, let's wrap it up. Uh, if you've got any more questions, you're going to have to give it to me right now. Otherwise, we're going to have to reconvene this time next week. Uh, as I said before, I will be going to Ghana very shortly. I'll be going for two weeks, uh, starting June, sorry, June. February the 22nd. Uh, today's what, the 8th? So it's not too long, less than two weeks. Uh, so I'll be here next week. And I may do a session if I'm in Ghana, uh, God willing. Uh, but we'll see. I may just take a two week hiatus. And, uh, but we'll see. So again, uh, I hope everybody enjoyed this session today. I hope it was informative, educational. And the next thing now is to take action. So let's take some actions, let's make it happen and let's uh, be a successful real estate investor with that said and done thank you and have a wonderful have a wonderful evening take care bye for now